do that. There we go. Um, so what we're talking about here today is designing a botanical garden for, for research and aesthetics. So um, serving two masters in one space, both science and art. Um, yeah, I told you a little bit about me already, so you don't need to read that one. There we go, the nature fix. Um, my areas of interest, yes, phylogeny, plant relationships, plant adaptation, plants, they're just really cool. Uh, hydro and aero and aquaponics, I'm gonna be teaching a, a new class in that in the fall. I'm really interested in sustainability and what we all can do um, to be, to mitigate climate change. And I'm super into the health benefits of being outdoors. Um, background on the garden. So, um, Dr. Chris Kramer is an onion breeder and he wanted to do some research into pollinators. And so he wrote a grant and um, it included a landscape designer. And so this is the location where the garden is. So this is University Avenue right here. Um, this is El Paseo, which becomes Union right here. This is the convention center, the new hotel. This is I-10, and here is where the garden is. So if you've been around the NMSU campus, these are three entomology buildings. This is the cotton gin, and so here's the garden down here. It's kind of hidden away. Used to be an alfalfa field for, um, for uh, animal and range science, um, but now it's ours. So when Dr. Kramer first started designing um, his research, um, well, he's a scientist. And so what he designed, um, you know, he, he envisioned the plants and he was envisioned them as all being 2.7 meters square and they'd be about five feet apart one way and about 10 feet apart the other way. And there'd be 130 plants and that would end up looking something like this. So again, the view from space. And so he was just gonna line up all these plants in a row. And um, that's really a great idea for science, but this was intended also to be a space where people could go and, and get into the beauty of it. And while the plants might be pretty in rows, uh, we had some other ideas. So he has four reps because he's going to be repeating the plant materials four different times. Each of them has 130 plants in the rep. And so there's 520 plants total that he would be studying. So um, this is, I'm going to show you some of the plants that he, that he had on his list. So he was just basically looking for things that flower and bring pollinators. And they're not necessarily natives. They're not necessarily things that, that we know um, commonly growing here. He was just kind of casting an extremely wide net for plants that he knew that um, pollinators enjoyed. So this is kind of plants that I had never heard of before thread leaf ragwort, desert lavender, lesser catmint. I mean, I know catmint. I didn't know Golden Alexander. This, that's, that's a few of them. Then there were ones where I knew some relatives of them, allium, sure. I know onions, monarda, verbena, uh, penstemon, but I didn't know uh, pinifolius, and salvia. I know plenty of salvias, but I wasn't, um, I'm not, I don't know dessert all that well. So um, by the way, his pictures were taken. He's, he's got some of these planted out in, there's two different fields actually right now. One across the street from the Fabian Garcia Research Center and one inside Fabian Garcia where he's been trialing these plants for, um, well, going on two years now. So then there were some plants that I definitely had heard of. Perovskia, yeah, we all know Russian sage. We all know chocolate flower, yellow ice plant, cat mint, sure. Asclepius is somebody, this one over here on the left, I'm familiar with that from when I lived in Tucson. This is a great plant for the monarchs. They love this, but um, as you can see, it's kind of struggling uh, here, at least in that field. So his entire list was 274 different plants. and like I said, he cast a really wide net and just started bringing them in and seeing what happens. And some of them have done okay. Some of them have done great. Some of them have done terrible. So as I said, there's ongoing field uh, trials at Fabian Garcia where he's watching to see what's going to succeed and what isn't. 
and here's pictures of some stuff that's not really succeeding all that well. Yeah, you can see over here the Perovskia, the Russian sage is doing just fine. And then we have sticks and holes. So not all of them are going to work. So that's the science part of it. And so then we start adding the art part of it and bringing the aesthetics into the science. So, so Chris presented me with that, that picture with the blue squares in the, in the green field and said, like, here's my idea. And so he explained his scientific perimeters, what he was talking about. They need to be so far apart. They need to be, you know, this many reps in each plot, um, this many plants in each plot, four reps. So I had to take that into, into consideration when designing the garden repetitions, the spacing. Um, confounding factors such as, um, is there shade in the garden? Are there places where the soil is different? Now we had a soil test done and mostly the soil is all the same. But so I needed to take all those things into consideration for the, for the rest of the garden. Um, and I also wanted to make it visually appealing and welcoming and recognize that it's a public space. So it needs to be something that is appealing to, to not just the scientist who can come through and say, oh yes, this plant is doing well, but also to just somebody who just wants to see a pretty garden. So back to the plants. So I took Chris's list, that, that list I showed you before, and so I broke it down into ways, into um, uh, categories that worked for me as far as designing. So I went for plants that were under one and a half feet tall, so the ground covers basically, broke them down into those ones. Then I went into ones that were between one, uh, one and a half feet tall to three feet tall, and there were 55 species in that list, so here's some of those guys. Yeah, so we've got the scientific name, the common name, um, quantity available, meaning, you know, that's, anyway, uh, where he got them from, the mature size, which are spread, the plant family, the color, the flower time, native to New Mexico. You can see that there's a lot of them that are not native to New Mexico. Um, so, so there ended up being four different size classifications. We have 20 in below uh, one and a half, feet. We have 55 species between one and a half to three feet. 25, uh, excuse me, 25 species, yes, between two and five feet. And then um, over five feet, we have six specimens. And then there were 12 species. I just couldn't really find reliable information on the mature size, so I just kind of stuck them at the end of the list. So the original idea, as I said, was, you know, let's put 130 plants in rows and do it four times and see what happens. Um, so I took that and created something that's a little bit more um, visually, maybe visually appealing um, than just plants in a row. So, you know, back here, you've got the four different reps. So the 130 plants in each. So here's a one rep, plot number one, plot number two, plot number three, and plot number four. So they're all exactly the same and they all have 100, well, they have a little bit more than 130 plants in them, but they all give room to replicate the exact same planting in the four different plots so that Chris can gather data on how they're doing. So um, looking at one plot specifically, so it has, hmm, hmm. so I told you I broke them down into the four different sizes. So we have six number ones. So those are the pink circles. So they go in the center of each plot, or they go, they go there. Then we have uh, 41 of the ones that are between two and five feet tall, and they kind of surround the ones that are taller than five feet. So think of it also this way, tallest, next tallest, less tall, the 76 number threes, which are the ones between one and a half feet and three feet tall. And then finally, 53 number fours, which are basically the ground covers. So you take and repeat this four different times to create the plots for each one of these. Did that all make sense? I hope so. Um, now, of course, that means, I mean, Chris had 130 plants in each rep and I have 176. 
So that gives him some um, flexibility to add more of some things that are doing better than other things and gives him the chance to swap out things that are uh, doing better or if he gets in a new species, he could stick it in in a place where it fits size-wise with the other ones. Um, so that's, that's the plan for the research side of it. For the art side of it, so um, you can see here in the center, this square, my plan for that is to have a covered gazebo that will be ADA compliant. So people can just, in wheelchairs or who are also mobile, whatever way mobily challenged, they can just walk straight down here and come inside the sheltered uh, covered space where there will be some shade. Uh, the way I'm envisioning it, so these uh, yellow, purple, and pink, this would be annuals, just something pretty to put in there for year-round color but it's a raised bed and then it's got seating on both sides so you can sit here and all the way around on the inside but then you can also come out here and walk over here and sit on the outside of it so what whichever side you decide to choose, sit on you are sitting beside the flowers and this would be a walkway so that you're not walking in the plants um, this will be 20 by 20 and so that's quite large and um, yeah, that's going to be that, that's going to be a further down the road kind of an addition to the garden. So again, we're back to the main plot plan. So here's the entryway. Um, currently, that's pointing north. That's at the north side of the field, and there would be parking here. Um, I I talked about confounding factors. So um, on the north side of the field is some very old. Um, I'm not remembering right now, uh, they look terrible, some trees. So if these trees are shading these plots, that will mean that these, these plants here are growing in a different condition than these plants down here. So one of the things I need to do is make sure that all the plants are receiving as closely as possible the same sort of environmental conditions, that nobody's getting shade at a time when other people aren't getting shade, and that they're all irrigated the same. So I will have to pull the garden to the south enough so that this, these trees up here don't end up shading any of these plants that are in the research plot. But we also need parking so we can put the parking over here. Um, I also incorporated some detention basins. Um, you feel strongly that the best place to store your free water that comes out of the sky is back in the ground. And so I want to grade this so that water that falls here can go into these detention basins and just slowly seep into the ground and, and add to the irrigation for the plants themselves that are planted in that region. I also have a number of different uh, demonstration areas and I'm still actually kind of trying to figure out what I want to do with those spaces. Um, I would like them to be different things so that when you're, you can, you know, you can walk in here and come down here and go over here and maybe this is a medicinal herbs little corner and you can sit here in this bench and read about the medicinal herbs. Maybe down here is some edible landscaping so you can come down here and learn about some plants you could put in your own uh, landscape that are edible. Um, native plants, pollinators. I would love to do some plant trials on some plants that I know and love from Tucson. Um, there are native medicinal plants that I will also like combine the two of those into one thing. And then I want to have lots of seating so that people can hang out and enjoy themselves. So these little rectangular things are little benches for people to hang out in when they come and sit down. And last of all is a children's play area where I'd like to also do a sensory garden. So plants that you can touch and smell and taste and feel and um, all those kinds of things that would make it a place where kids can enjoy themselves and maybe a little bit away from this so that, you know, like me, I'm not so much into kids. I can go over here and enjoy the shade and somebody can be over there with their kids having a great time. Um, some benches there and just a good place. This is a little bit more shady because of those trees that are over here, so maybe the kids could enjoy that area. So it, there's a lot of different things going on in there, and like I said, even though this has been designed for over a year now, we just didn't know when it was going to take off, and so that's why I still don't actually have 100% concrete plans for what's going in every single spot on this place. Um, so, sorry, going back for just a second. Um, 
you remember that the interstate is very near there. So that's another factor that I have to take into consideration because of the interstate being there and it's really loud, uh, yet Dr. Kramer doesn't want to have trees that are shading the research plots. So um, I'm trying to figure out a way to get some, some trees over on the south side so that we can maybe mitigate some of that noise a little bit. Um, but then it, it's got to be trees that won't shade. The flip side of that is I'm also thinking that Dr. Kramer may not be doing the research here forever. So maybe I'll plant some trees when I start and there'll be slow growing trees. And so in seven years, we can have trees that are shading this. Because that's another really actually a big element of this design. Um, I think we, especially living in the desert, when we come to a garden, we do automatically sort of migrate to the shady spaces. Um, we're drawn to those, we like to see the views, but we also, I mean, you know, even, you know, come June, nobody wants to be out walking around, you know, in the, uh, without any shade nearby. So that actually is kind of, um, that's a real difficult challenge for me to work with him because I, I really like to put those trees in there for people to migrate towards. And also there's the element of different layers of of plantings. And so, you know, I broke down the, the research plots into different sizes. So they get up to be about six feet tall. And then you, you want another level above that. You want those trees so that you can feel, um, you can feel, it, it helps some people to feel safe to have trees around them. It, it gives a sense of um, enclosure and a sense of sort of not being out in the midst of everything. So there's that psychological factor of trees. And so to have that kind of, it's not that it's been removed from me, it's that I can't do it right away. Um, so that's that's all been taken into account here too. It's it's more than just like, hey, throw some plants in the ground. It's, it's actually quite a, quite a big um, design challenge. So um, let's see, I, so, okay, so like I said, I started landscape design in Tucson. There are a lot of plants over there that I think should be able to work here. I, um, I'm a, a snob about plants. I am sick to death of Nandina and Euonymus and uh, Mexican elder and, and Cyp Italian cypress, I wanna, see, I wanna see some other things. And I want them not to be plants that, um, that are gonna need a ton of water because obviously we don't have a ton of water to give to them. Well, that's not obvious. We don't have water to waste on them. I'd like to use some plants that come from over there that I think they should do. So here's some of the plants I'd like to think about maybe putting over there. Um, I love this little leaf cordia. I, I put that in landscapes all over. This guajillo, it's a cute little tree, but it's it's really pretty small and it might actually fit in and maybe, um, maybe Chris wouldn't be irritated to have that small tree nearby. This is an agave that should be able to grow here. I really like the look of it. Uh, maybe I could introduce it into the landscapes around here. Oh, yeah. Acacia farnesiana. Um, Michelia is now the name. This sweet acacia. If you've been to a place where this is blooming, the smell is absolutely intoxicating. And I would love to introduce that to the landscapes around here and let people know that there's a new plant they can use. Um, Hopbush, fantastic plant. Could easily replace all the uh, euonymus around here or all the oleander. Um, I'm sorry, I don't mean to offend anybody. These are just my personal opinions. So you love what you love. Um, here's some Muhlenbergia that I, that I like that's a little bit taller that maybe people, people might be interested in. Uh, I don't even know this Amsonia, but it should be able to grow here, supposedly. Um, we've got Greg's Mist Flower, Bauhania. I love this guy. That would be a really beautiful little patio tree around here. Uh, Manfreda, look how cool that is. Justicia, I have seen Justicia around here. I just don't know that it's in any of the nurseries around here. Um, and that's, I just love this plant. I know that it will freeze. I also know that it will come back. Um, we have lots of Hesperallo around here, but I don't see much of the Funifera, and I think the shape of it is just fantastic. I'd love to see more of it around here. Um, a couple of penstemons that uh, should grow here, but I haven't seen them. Here's a new hybrid Opuntia, which I think would be just glorious to see. 
Um, Ruelia, I love these little dwarf Ruelias. I think they're just so sweet. Um, again, these are my opinions. You don't have to adopt them. I love Polyamintha. The smell of this is fantastic. It would be great to introduce something else into the garden that has some, some smell. That might be a good thing for the sensory garden. Um, salvia, I just adore salvia, and this one had just been introduced when I left Tucson to the nursery trade where I saw it. Um, it's a new high or was a new hybrid. Anyway, I love this. I love to see it here. I love this raspberry light. It's very pretty. Here's another penstemon that I'm not I'm not um, familiar with um, that I just think is adorable. I love penstemons. Uh, jojoba, why do we not have jojoba here? We should have jojoba here. Uh, Arizona rosewood, we should have Arizona rosewood here. I do see some of it, but I'd really love to get people away from the oleander and into something else that does a similar job but is native, at least to that desert. Um, this senna is just fantastic and is an early flowering plant in the spring, and so that would be really nice. Okay, so those were the plants, again, those, it's my opinion, just, just some ideas of plants I might want to try. I don't know. I meant no offense if you don't like those plants. Um, so my challenges. So we've got the borrowed views, like I said. We've got the highway right there. We've got the cotton gin, which, you know, it's not ugly, but it's not beautiful. Here's those trees-ish. Here's the old buildings. Um, however, the view off here to the east is spectacular so that that will be a beautiful view to see um this right here you can't really tell but right here this is this big concrete culvert that's in the corner and so when this was alfalfa then they would flood irrigate it and i don't think they actually did it from here because this is all busted up but somehow i've got to see about working around that because it's unsightly at best um, trees, we talked about my challenges with the trees. I'd like to put more trees there. The highway noise, we talked about that. The concrete culvert. So what's the goal of this garden? Well, obviously we wrote the grant, we got the Stanley W. Smith Horticultural Trust grant to do the research. Um, so that's the first goal, that's for, that's for Dr. Kramer. Uh, for me, I look at it as, as a teaching garden for my different courses, plant materials, irrigation, landscape construction, landscape design. I'd love to have a place where I can go and take my plant materials classes and be like, here's the 10 plants from this week. So bam, right there, instead of having to drive all over to find them all. Uh, I'd love to see this as a community, community building activity between the master gardeners that I know and love and my students that I know and love. I love the mixing of uh, different um, age groups. Sorry, I had to turn on my light. Um, and I just love to see them interacting. There's so much that, that the master gardeners have to teach the students. I would just love to have them out there and work together. That would make me smile a lot. Um, a demonstration garden for landscape plant ideas. Like I said, I'm sick of seeing the same plants around. I'd love to see some new stuff. I'd love to get the nurseries to go out, the, the local nurseries to go out and see, oh, look, there are, this does really well here. Like people will want to see this. Maybe they'd want to sponsor a little plot. I don't know. We, we have many ideas about how to raise money. And of course, a public outdoor gathering space, just a new place for people to go and hang out together and um, enjoy the beautiful outdoors. And then where are we in the process? Well, um, like I said, we did get the Stanley W. Smith um, Horticultural Trust grant was for enough to buy about um, half of the irrigation stuff that we need. Um, no, yes, we bought half the irrigation stuff we need. We got another third, another quarter of it donated from a company, and then we need to raise funds to get the fourth uh, quarter of the, the irrigation for the plots only um, to get all that ready to go. We're waiting on getting a water line installed. Um, that's been, yeah, that's been super fun. I'll just leave it at that. Then after that happens, well, I was supposed to have a class this semester where we were all gonna work on getting the irrigation lines in, but of course there's no more face-to-face -face class. So hopefully that will happen in the fall. The truth is the plants will do better if we install them in the fall anyway. But um, yeah, coronavirus. Um, 
So the first, after we get the water in, then we'll install the research plot. Uh, we need to do a lot of fundraising. Um, and I need to finalize the rest of the design. I have a lot of ideas. I just, I don't have access to a drafting table anymore. My drafting table is at work. So uh, that's, a, yeah, that's actually a real legitimate issue at this point. Um, but anyway, we're just, we're just gonna keep plugging on and seeing how we can get done what we can get done without anybody going outside. And um, that's, that's where we are.